Pastor Mark Sell here of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Fenton, Missouri. So, if you've been watching television or heard the news, there hasn't been much going on other than a Supreme Court nomination. And you get sick of it in a hurry. Yeah, you've got the senators asking questions after questions over a nominee to the Supreme Court. And you might wonder, that ah, doesn't have much to do with me, but however it works out, whatever. Well, here's a little bit of insight as to why Supreme Court nominations and judges, why they're so important to the Christian church. Well, first of all, it's part of the American system, of course. It's one of the branches of government. And so when the laws are created, the judges simply say, oh, when it makes it up to the Supreme Court, well, that's the law you passed, and we take the Constitution, and yeah, it's Constitution, go on. And that whole process, and it's far more complicated than that. It takes years sometimes to get a case up to the Supreme Court. But every judge, every judge, not just Supreme Court judges, they have to take the Constitution and say, so does that work with the Constitution? Hmm. Huh. Uh, what? No, it's not constitutional. And it gets thrown out. This is what the Constitution has in, this, has in the same common thinking as the Constitution of the United States. It's got to be read and interpreted. Well, what else gets read and interpreted? The Bible. Exactly. And this is a gross generalization. But for the sake of a five to seven minute video, well, of course, I'm going to make some generalizations, especially on philosophy of language. <laughs> Give me a break. So the Bible and the Constitution. Those of us who use both as a citizen, the Constitution is important. As a Christian citizen, the Bible's important. They both have to be interpreted. So when you take the Bible or you take the Constitution, you read it. When you start reading it, the issue becomes, what does that say? What does it say? What does it mean? Well, there's been a big mess that we've experienced. And, you know, the church already fought this battle. It's fought it throughout the centuries because whether or not you're going to take God's word for what it is or if you are not. Could you hand me my Bible, please? After, of course, uh, Angela told me, don't forget, you got to use your Bible. Then what did I do? I moved it away anyway. So thank God for Angela. And, um, but when you take the Bible, you're going to take it and then you start reading the words. And you say, so what does Jesus mean? Who is Jesus? How do we know who Jesus is? And the Bible interprets itself. You just don't pick up one word and say, Jesus. Well, you know what Jesus is because you're reading other parts of the Bible. The Constitution is the same thing. But our church body had this big battle in the 70s. And now that battle is playing out with the judicial system of the United States. The issue always is, do you take the word of God for what it is, and it's simple, plain language, and then say, that's what it means. It's sort of like a stop sign. You gotta take a stop sign seriously, especially if you're driving. If you're driving down the road, you see the stop sign, you know you have to, that's right, you have to stop. Why? It's been communicating, been communicated to you, you learned what it is, and you see millions of them, so you know what it means. But it doesn't work very well if you're driving down the road and suddenly you say, well, that red sign with the letter stop on it, that doesn't mean that to me. It means something else to me. And wait, it's something different from yesterday. Today it's going to mean hit the gas. Now I know some of you think that's what yellow means, but that's a different issue. No, a stop sign means you must stop. And it didn't change from yesterday. It didn't change its meaning. 
The Constitution and the Bible have fought the same battle in the 70s. Our church body said, look, the Bible is God's word, and you take the Bible in its own context. What did those who wrote it mean? And you take by their writings or people who commented on their writings, and it gets very clear very quickly. And so we take the meaning for what the text actually says. This is why pastors learn Greek and Hebrew, because we want to get even beyond the English when we can. Then learn what scholars, if you remember the one video or videos coming up to where I picked up a commentary and there are massive commentaries on little books of the Bible. Well, that's because you delve the meaning out of it and unpack all those words, but you always say they are consistent with the meaning of the time frame and how those used it in their community. And that is the word that has been consistent and persistent throughout history. That really then became the difference between liberal churches and conservative churches of all brands. When we went through our mess in the 70s, it was kind of bubbling underneath before everybody in the church realized it. For maybe 20 years, we, we had borrowed a philosophical system and made that end up overruling the simple meaning of the word. The words in their context, where they are. And then suddenly, you start interpreting the Bible in ways that, but that's not there. You're, you're reading into that from 1970. You're saying just because this means this now, you're going to go back and change the meaning of the Bible? Well, that's what went on. And that's why you end up in the, the extreme forms we see the Missouri Synod. We're proud to say the Bible is God's word, period. It's without error. We take it what it means in its original context. Is this starting to sound familiar like what you've been seeing on TV with the Constitution? We take the meanings for what the meanings say, how the original authors used them, and that's the meaning of the Bible. So that Jesus is always true God, true man throughout history. It doesn't change because, oh, I don't know, I'm a hippie from the 70s, and now Jesus means something else to me, man. And now we get to redefine him. And forgiveness may be more about how you feel about yourself and how you treat your fellow man. And all of a sudden we're confusing long gospel and Jesus is gone. The Constitution of the United States, same thing. Do you take the words as our founders intended them to be taken? That's why you hear comments and thoughts about the Federalist Papers. Those were a bunch of the authors who immediately commented on it or were preparing it and then said, this is the Constitution. Well, why'd they use that word? Well, they used it here when they were writing their long articles, let's say, on this is why this concept is important. And they hammered it all out. And the Constitution means what it means based upon the intended authors. The Bible means what it means based first upon its intended author. God, who wants to save the world. The Holy Trinity, who sent his son, Jesus Christ. And so when our church body split in the 70s, it was that very battle. It was that very battle. Does the Bible say what it means? Does stop mean stop? Is Jesus the one true God? Can there be a holy trinity that's a mystery that reason can't explain away? And we accept it as a gift of God. We don't fill all the new meanings into it because, well, we went from the 1970s now to the 1980s. And then next decade, it's going to change again for you. And you're not going to be sure what laws are really laws constitutionally. And you're not going to be sure Biblically speaking, who Jesus is, whether forgiveness of sins is really there in baptism, whether when you go to the Lord's table, you're really there with angels and archangels. You see, original context, original author's intent, how it was originally used, it's the same game if you will, not that I think it's just a game, it's the same understanding of how do you read a text and then apply it. So now you see, it's the same thing. 
The battle for the Constitution of the United States is the same battle for the Bible that conservative churches went through throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We settled it in the Missouri, Missouri Synod. Many other churches are still fighting that battle. But once you lose the original intent, once you lose the original meaning, well, I have to say, look at the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America today. They, they don't believe anything anymore. Not that it's associ nothing associated with historic Christianity. They don't really stand up that Jesus is the only way to salvation. They certainly don't believe in the Trinity anymore. My goodness, they don't believe in marriage anymore. And now you have the whole problem of the breakdown in the family. So it goes from who Christ is and salvation, and all of a sudden you actually lose marriage and family, husbands and wives. And it just goes into this tailspin of a total loss of identity. Now think about the Constitution. Same thing. We in the United States, we know who we are. The original intent, the meaning of the text is important. And that meaning of the text is what we've always fought for. So that First Amendment rights are still First Amendment rights. Second, still second. And for us in the church, and you see now how it intersects, not only with texts and the interpretation, but also with application. So that's kind of what you're witnessing. Your local pastor, he knows all about this because he read all about it. Or if he's old enough, he experienced it. If he, were, if he was around in the 70s. My era of pastors, we came as the next generation after the 70s. So we were thankful to say, we fought that battle. We're not fighting it anymore, but we will defend it and keep speaking about it. Now it's time to get on to remember Lutherans forgive sins. And we know it, grace and forgiveness and who Jesus Christ is. So let's get on with it. So that's kind of what you're witnessing. The same battle over how do you take, read a text and interpret scripture. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, the Lord's blessings, and we'll see you next time on a pastor chat.